It is Thursday, June 9th. This is Spingola Speaks, and this is Deanna Spingola. Thanks for listening to this program. You may still donate to the RBN Pledge Drive, which ends within the hour. You can do that online at republicbroadcasting.org, by mail, or by phone at 800-724-2719. If you have not donated yet, please consider doing that. If you wish to see information on past or future guests for this program, go to spingola.com. To listen to any previous programs on RBN, go to republicbroadcasting.org. The archives are accessible for only $1.33 per month. One of our listeners created a Spingola Speaks YouTube channel. There's a link on my homepage and the radio schedule page. He provides snippets of several of my programs and helps to introduce people to RBN. We will take calls after my guest has presented his information when we open the phone lines at 800-313-9443. My guest today is Dave McGowan, the author of Derailing Democracy, The America the Media Don't Want You to See. Also, Understanding the F Word, and Program to Kill, The Politics of Serial Murder. His website is davesweb.cnchost.com. There is a link on the radio schedule page for his website. Uh, Welcome to the program, Dave. Hi, glad to be here. Well, thank you so much for joining me. Uh, I read your your first book, Derailing Democracy, and uh, it's it's very well done. It's a it's a really great book. Very good book. Thank really you enjoyed very it. much. It's, uh, it's a little dated now, <laughs> you know, being that it's a. Uh, I think it came out like a year before nine one one, which you know completely changed the uh, political landscape here pretty much. But. Um, it still, to me, it still has some value because uh, the interesting thing is that uh, so much of this stuff was actually already in the work, you know, as far as sort of the groundwork for the Patriot Act and, you know, all, all of the stuff that we've seen happen post-911 that has been, uh, you know, that 911 has been used as, as a pretext for and uh the value that that book has, I think, is that it, it, it documented before 911 how all of these all of these things were already actually in the work, just sort of waiting for a pretext to implement. But uh, I believe it, it might actually be out of print now. I'm not I'm not entirely sure, but I think it might be huh. uh, out of print. So I don't know if that particular one is even still available. But uh, if maybe it is, that people uh, could find it on um, Amazon as a used book, but. Uh, It definitely has a lot of – I like all the statistics you have in here uh, regarding the military-industrial complex and all the weapons and and who has provided all the training for all of the terrorist acts uh, throughout the world, who who provided all the guns, the ammunition, everything. I mean, you have it so well documented. It's uh, it's very well done. Thank Uh, you. Thank you. Okay. been years since anyone's even uh, mentioned that book. It's uh, kind of weird. To, <laughs> I, I don't. I don't even remember myself uh, all that clearly what all's in there. Oh, it's so, good. You uh, ought to read it. <laughs> yeah, maybe. <I'm laughs> uh, okay, we are going to go to a three-minute break. Then we're going to come back and talk about Laurel Canyon, which is amazing. This series is amazing. Stay tuned. Be right back in three minutes. Welcome back, friends. My guest today is Dave McGowan, the author of Derailing Democracy, The America the Media Don't Want You to See. And it is available on Amazon. I just took a little peek, and they have some used copies of it there. Uh, But we're going to talk about Laurel Canyon and the birth of the hippie generation. Now, uh, Dave, in part two you wrote, and I quote, Are we to believe that the only kids from that era who had any musical talent were the sons and daughters of Navy admirals, chemical warfare engineers, and Air Force intelligence officers, or are they just the ones who were signed to lucrative contracts and relentlessly promoted by their labels and the media? 
Did I write that? <laughs> you did. You did. Uh, yeah, that's. Uh, I mean, basically, that's that's what I found in looking into this story time after time after time as I looked into the backgrounds of all of the uh, the big name musicians who populated Laurel Canyon in the mid to late 1960s. Uh, we're talking about you know people that that led the most influential bands of the era, like. Uh, Jim Morrison of The Doors and David Crosby of The Birds and Stephen Stills of uh, Buffalo Springfield and Frank Zappa of uh, The Mothers of Invention, John Phillips of The Mamas and the Papas, and, and on and on down the line. And what I found time after time is that pretty much every one of them is, has direct connections to the, you know, quote-unquote military intelligence complex uh, and, and quite deep you know, family connections. And, you know, if you find that maybe, you know, once or twice, you might uh, you might be tempted to just write it off as, you know, a sort of a trivial insignificant, and interesting, but, you know, not necessarily relevant detail. But when you find it time after time after time, uh, you know, at some point, uh, it's no longer, uh, it can no longer be written off to coincidence or, or uh, you know, or whatnot. There, there, there's got to be... Uh, there's, there had to be some some behind the scenes uh, manipulations that went into creating a scene where all of these sort of uh, people who represented you know the anti war movement and uh, peace and love and all that stuff uh, were deeply tied to the to the intelligence community you know through through family connections and otherwise. Um, you know, as a few examples, Jim Morrison's father was a, a Navy admiral, and uh, not just any Navy admiral, but the one who happened to be in command of the Pacific Fleet that was involved in the Gulf of Tonkin incident. Uh, he was the commanding officer of, of those ships. So he was, you know, a, a, a direct uh, conspirator, so to speak, in staging, because it's now pretty well acknowledged by, by, by uh, you know, most people that, that uh, the Gulf of Tonkin incident didn't really even happen. It was, it was uh, basically a, a staged, manipulated event uh, designed to draw the U.S. deeper and deeper into the Vietnam War. And, you know, here, here you have this guy's father was a, a major player in that whole scenario at the very same time that the son was... Uh, you know, coming to the forefront as uh, you know the leader of the you know one one of the figureheads of the, of the uh, you know the anti-war peace and love movement, and uh, you know Frank Zappa's father was a uh, engineer at uh, the Edgewood Arsenal, I think it was, as a you know chemical biological warfare uh, engineer. Uh, John Phillips' father was a career Marine Corps officer, and his mother worked at the Pentagon, and his first wife worked at the Pentagon. Uh, and he himself uh, went to Annapolis, you know, got an appointment to uh, Annapolis Naval Academy. So, you know, he had very deep connections. And just on and on and on and on and on, you know, right down through the list. And then, uh, you know, from there I also took a look at, because in addition to the musicians in Laurel Canyon, there was this other... Uh, sort of uh, Hollywood subculture of young actors who were known as the Young Turks, uh, which was like Peter Fonda and Dennis Hopper and Bruce Dern and uh, Sharon Tate and Jane Fonda and, and you know um, all of these uh, all of these people. And as I started to look into their backgrounds, once again, right down the line, you have the same. You know, the same pattern. Uh, Bruce Dern, uh, one of his uncles, I believe it was, was like Skull and Bones. And, uh, you know, he had some other deep connections. And uh, Dennis Hopper is fairly recently acknowledged that his dad was uh, OSS, you know, which is the precursor to the CIA. And, and just so, you know, I mean, it's just it's just overwhelming at some point that, uh, you know, that, that every one of these people uh seem to come from that same from that same uh you know that same uh, uh military intelligence background yeah. and so yeah so you know especially you got to ask the question it, it, were those just the only people that had the talent to to make it you know at that time or was there another reason that they were sort of uh, groomed for those positions 
position, you know, which in my opinion is it's the latter, that they were definitely groomed to, to basically fill those positions and, uh, you know, and, and lead the, the 60s uh, youth movement in ways that the powers that be wanted it moved. Wow. Uh, why don't you tell the audience uh, where Laurel Canyon is, just in case somebody isn't aware of where it is. And um, I, I, and you also mentioned the Hollywood, the movie stars that live there, and and you talk about the deaths. Now, you can read the uh, what, um, what Dave has talked about at his website. He's got, uh, what is it, like 15 or 16 uh, uh, parts? I think it's actually 18 parts now. It's like nearly book length, but... It's, uh, yeah, and, and amply illustrated with lots of uh, photos and that'll kind of, you know, give you a feel for, for this area. Um, yeah, Laurel Canyon, basically, it's, it's a, uh, it's, it's not actually, a, it's a part of Los Angeles. It's not actually a separate city, but it, it, it's a separate community, so to speak, in that it's very isolated and remote. It's up in the Hollywood Hills, um, you know, in this uh, very, remote, very woodsy, very rustic uh, setting that, that has a really a totally different feel from the rest of L.A., which is, you know, just sort of a big industrial waste plant, you know. But uh, the Low Canyon, it, it, it's very remote. It's very private. You know, there's basically one way in and one way out, you know, on Laurel Canyon Boulevard. So, so it's very private, very remote, and very close-knit. And, you know, they have their own school and their own little grocery store. And so it's really... Uh, it's really sort of a separate and unique community. And in the 60s, it was overrun with uh, all of the, the the pop stars, the rock stars, the the early um, the early hippies. You know, the, the basically it was it was the beginning of the hippie movement, which is one thing that a lot of a lot of people or most people associate that much more so with San Francisco and, and the Haight Ashbury. But Laurel Canyon was really uh, LA's version of Haight Ashbury, and it, it actually proceeded. It came along before, so the the movement actually started uh, in Laurel Canyon, and uh, you know then moved out elsewhere. And so, uh, so that's basically what that's basically the background of this story is, is how all of these people came together in this one small isolated location and uh, created really this 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 sort of uh, uh, youth youth revolution that, that uh, you know, as far as the music and the hairstyles and the fashions and, and the, you know, the whole the whole mythos of the, the 1960s hippie, hippie movement uh, really started there in this, this uh, little community. So um, that's, that's kind of the, 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 the background, basically, of, of, of Laurel Canyon. Sure. And you're suggesting that it was not spontaneous, but was rather orchestrated and planned, and that people were actually groomed to take to participate in this music scene. Yeah, I believe so. I mean, it just uh, it was very odd because L.A. was not at the time really known as a mecca of, uh, of music. It wasn't really a hub of the music industry. Uh, New York, New York, and Nashville, and um, uh, Detroit. Or Detroit. Yeah, the, the really, yeah, the, those the basically, uh, you know, pop music was kind of centered in New York. You know, you had uh, rhythm and blues in Detroit, and uh, you know, country in Nashville. And L.A. was was a very insignificant player, and yet it just literally, like almost overnight, became the capital of of the music industry as all of these these people just came flooding in, and uh, you know, took root in in Laurel Canyon, and all began playing the same kind of music, which was uh, folk rock, which was, was really kind of born born there, um, and it just it just you know, and, and you read the, the sort of mainstream conventional histories, and, and they would have you believe that it was just sort of a spontaneous, organic, you know, grassroots kind of thing that, that just came together. But uh, if you really look at it, it, it doesn't really add up that way. Uh, number one, you know, is, is the background. And also, a lot of these people actually knew each other uh, beforehand, I discovered. Like, uh, you know, Frank Zappa's wife, for example, had gone to kindergarten, uh, naval kindergarten, with Jim Morrison, you know, way back when they were like five years old, you know. And, uh, and Warren Beatty, uh, 
who was another of, of the Young Turks, uh, you know, he was a high school rival of a uh, basketball rival of John Phillips of the Mamas and the Papas, you know, and, and they both years later ended up in Laurel Canyon. Cass Elliott came from the same high school. Uh, you know, so you have all of these, all of these prior connections between these people that, that kind of refute the notion that it was just sort of a other, you know, and in addition, all of their intelligence background and the fact that a, a very high percent them came directly from the, the Washington, D.C. area. Right. Um, uh, could you hold that thought, Dave? We do have to take another three-minute break, and we will be right back after a word from our sponsors. Welcome back, friends. My guest today is Dave McGowan, and his website is davesweb.cnchost.com. It's also linked on the radio schedule page. Uh, now, just before the break, you were talking about so many of these people also came from the Washington, D.C. area. Uh, yeah, uh, a, a very high percentage of them. Uh, you know, the, one of the monkeys, uh, Peter Tork, I believe, was, was from there. As, as I already mentioned, you know, John Phillips and Cass Elliott, Warren Beatty, um, God, just a, a whole bunch of them. I'm, I'm drawing a blank right now, unfortunately. Uh, well, uh, you said Jim Morrison's, you, you said I, Jim I Morrison's like father Jim was kind of complicit in the Bay of Tonkin uh, incident. And um, so kind of explain what was going on at the time. We, we, were, uh, we were going into the Vietnam War uh, and uh, lots and lots of things going on at the time. Yeah, there was there was a lot a lot going on. There was, there was quite a bit of turmoil. The, the Vietnam War was definitely heating up. You know, we were, we were already in there, uh, but you know, m- more or less covertly, we didn't have we weren't uh, we did not have troops uh, boots on the ground as they say these days. And uh, the Gulf of the Tonkin incident, uh, which is when you know a couple of U.S. destroyers were allegedly attacked in the in the Gulf by uh, by Vietnamese forces. Um, which was later, you know, hotly disputed whether whether it even happened. But that is the incident that uh, that really turned turned it around and, and turned it into a full scale ground war that eventually cost what like fifty eight thousand Americans their lives and and God knows how many uh, Vietnamese and Cambodians, Laotians, just literally millions. Right. And uh, you know that was just heating up. Uh, there was already opposition to it. There was a, there was a budding anti-war movement, which was uh, primarily centered on college campuses and, and led by you know respectable college professors and, and their students. And uh, and there were various other uh, movements, uh, you know, um, civil rights movements, women's rights. It was just a time when when there was a lot of groups that were sort of uh, you know. Struggling to 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 assert that uh, you know their right, and uh, you know I, I, the government uh, you know knew that this this was going to heat up, and so I believe that uh, basically the, the, the hippie movement, uh, which became and in many people's mind is is now the, the face of the '60s anti-war movement, I believe that was that was very deliberate and that. Uh, they did not want to see the anti-war movement continue to grow as a more mainstream uh, sort of movement, and they, they wanted to marginalize it as much as possible. And so they really just basically created the whole hippie movement and you know flower child movement and the uh, you know the music that went along with it, and uh, and and put a face on the anti-war movement that that frankly was. You know, offensive to to much of mainstream America. You know, I mean, everything about it, from the music to the the open drug usage to the hairstyles to the clothing to you know the everything about it was just just uh, you know offensive to to a lot of people. And I believe that 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 was a very deliberate effort, and that you know the hippies weren't weren't the original anti-war movement, and 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 were not. Uh, were not intended to advance that movement, but rather were intended to marginalize it and, and put a put an offensive face on it, basically. So that's uh, that's basically the, the way I see it, you know, based on all, all of the all the research that I've done at this point. 
It, sure. It really... So it was a psychological intelligence operation, basically. Yeah, basically it was. Yeah, very much so. And uh, I, I think it's a very, it's a very misunderstood by uh, most people in, in Romania and by, uh, by me, uh, you know, as one of them. Uh, you know, I mean, I, I kind of, I was actually born in '60s, so I, I sort of came of age in the '70s. But I always considered myself sort of a, a hippie that just, you know, had the misfortune of being born ten years too late and. Uh, I always, you know, embraced that music and, and the whole, uh, you know, the whole countercultural scene, and, and you know, I believed it was organic, and, and uh, but I, I can't really believe that anymore, you know, based on on. And so this this was really a kind of a difficult journey for me because I, you know, I've watched a lot of my former idols kind of fall by the wayside as I realized that you know they weren't necessarily what uh, what I thought they were. Sure. Sure. Uh, now, you talk about all the murders in yeah. Laurel Canyon, which is amazing. Now, do the uh, does your book, um, let's see, uh, Program to Kill the Politics of Serial Murder, does that cover Laurel Canyon, Canyon or is that about military? Military. No, that came out uh, several years before Laurel Canyon. That, that's basically, it's, uh, it's a bit, more or less about serial killers. It's also about uh, uh, the, the the beginning. Actually, the first the first section of it is sort of is about uh, like organized uh, uh, pedophilia rings, um, elite, uh, you know, the involving uh, top levels of the military and the government and the media and and, uh, and whatnot, and sort of looks into these various cases. I don't, I don't know if you. You cover that that sort of thing on uh, on your show, but uh, we cover you know, a lot of very controversial things. Yes, like you know the the, the uh, it Basically, it, it covers a lot of cases, it documents a lot that uh, a lot of cases that have occurred overseas. Uh, okay. You know, uh, Dave, we do have to take another three minute break. We will be right back. Welcome back, friends. My guest today is Dave McGowan. That's M-C, capital G-O-W-A-N. And uh, he was telling us about his book, Program to Kill. It was written in 2004. It is available on Amazon. And um, so tell us a little bit about that. You were, yeah, you were in the middle of telling us about it. Uh, basically, it, what it, well, uh, I guess the best, Hard to summarize. It basically covers uh, a lot of uh, high-profile serial killer cases and uh, sort of traces uh, a lot of the hidden threads, a lot of the aspects of the, the, these these crimes that do not receive a lot of publicity, uh, like uh, indications of mind control, uh, a lot of occult symbolism and overtones, uh, organized pedophilia, like uh, child prostitution, child pornography, uh, hidden intelligence connections, um, you know, and, and against this, this, this backdrop of, of extreme violence, obviously. And um, I reference it quite a bit throughout the Laurel Canyon series, the reason being is that those very same threads run through that story. You, you find these very... Those very same themes, you know, these very, very dark undertones uh, to the Laurel Canyon scene, including the, the, the just extreme levels of violence, uh, which you, you mentioned, uh, I think, in the last segment, that the, there was just this, this uh, you know, this was supposedly this sort of peace and love and brotherhood scene, but, uh, but there was just this extreme levels of violence in, in lurking just below the surface. Uh, it, it, you know, during that scene, and so that's uh, so. Yeah, I, I, I draw a lot of parallels between between that the book and uh, and all of the stuff that I've been uh, researching and writing about uh, concerning Laurel Canyon. Uh, uh, right, and so many of those uh, musicians and singers uh, died very young, and it seemed like they all died from heroin overdose or an accident or or something. But uh, in fact, you say. And this this started early, like in the 1920s. And you said, and I quote, 
Statistically speaking, if you were a famous actor in the 1920s, you would have been better off playing a round of Russian roulette than living in Laurel Canyon, unquote. Yeah. And it started there in, in the 1920s and just uh, moved forward. Yeah, it, it's rather uncanny how, how, uh, how many deaths, how many, many uh, curious deaths surround, surrounded that whole scene from, a very, from the very early, early years, as you mentioned, and really, uh, really accelerated during the, during the late six, mid to late 60s and early 70s and uh, throughout the 70s, actually. And it was just, it just, uh, just, un, just unfathomable the levels of violence. Uh, like the the two the two most notorious mass murder cases in in Los Angeles's history and Los Angeles is, is a has a pretty violent history so but according to uh, you know the grizzled detectives of the LAPD the the, the two most bloody brutal uh, mass murders ever committed in the city were the Manson murders on Ciala Drive in Benedict Canyon and the what were known as the Four on the Floor or the Wonderland murders which actually occurred in Laurel Canyon on Wonderland Boulevard involved the bludgeoning deaths of uh, four reputed uh, Laurel Canyon drug dealers. And, uh, and that, both of those murders were directly, both of those mass, mass murders were directly related to the Laurel Canyon scene. Um, you know, like I say, the one actually occurred right there in the heart of Laurel Canyon. And the other was a few canyons over, but virtually all of the People involved in it, uh, both victims and uh, perpetrators, were were Laurel Canyon regulars. Uh, you know, uh, uh, Folger and Frykowski actually lived in a house on uh, I think it was Woodrow Wilson Drive, directly across the street from the home of Mama Cass, where Charles Manson and some of his followers were reputed to have, have hung out. Uh, Charles Manson was a was considered by many in the Laurel Canyon crowd to be kind of a peer. Uh, you know, he was a, he considered himself to be a musician and songwriter and, and whatnot. And, uh, you know, he, he had a lot of connections <laughs> to a lot of these people that, that have been, you know, kept buried for all these years. Um, you know, I mean, some of them are known. I mean, he actually lived in Dennis Wilson's home for an entire summer. You know, and then Wilson recorded his his songs, and then uh, the Beach Boys even recorded their own version of one of his songs. But uh, you know, so so both both of these 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 very high profile, very violent, very bloody mass murders were directly tied to this uh, peace and love scene, and and those were just the two most you know uh, most high profile. There were numerous other murders. You know, bodies turn up dead in, in Laurel Canyon, you know, on a regular basis, pretty much, you know, some, some well-known, like uh, Ramon Navarro, a former, you know, silent film star that was murdered in his home in the 60s in Laurel Canyon, and an uh, uh, actress whose name escapes me, Ingrid Stevens, I think it was, uh, you know, a, 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 just a, an uncanny number of people, or people connected to people, uh, you know, like uh, several of the wives and girlfriends uh, turned up dead. I think Jackson Brown's wife and, and uh, Graham Nash's girlfriend and uh, various others. It's just a long laundry list of uh, violent murders uh, that were directly connected to this, to this scene. Right. Now, you you also uh, tell about the relationships, uh, for instance, uh uh, let's see, Harlow, Jean Harlow, uh, had three marriages and was the godmother to Bugsy Siegel's daughter, Millicent. And, I mean, you weave all of these relationships together and you think, my goodness, I mean, by the time you get to, to part four or five, you're, it's just overwhelming. The, the things that you weave, have weaved into your story, the facts, and uh, the, the network. And you think, well, how did all of this, how did this, uh, not just the, the, the musician, the musical scene, but how did Hollywood in general affect our society with the violence? Uh, yeah, that's a, <laughs> that's a good, yeah, I mean, that's a good question. Um, uh, it, it, the thing with this, with this story is it's, it, 
it's, it's kind of a difficult story to tell because it's not like a real linear sort of story. As you mentioned, everything just sort of loops around and is interconnected, and, and after a while it just seems like everything and everyone is connected to everything, you know. Um, so, so it's kind of a, it's, it's a difficult story to tell. Um, and, but as far as Hollywood, uh, Hollywood is, uh, is from its very beginning. From, from its earliest days has just been just a very, very violent place. It, it's just, it's, 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 there's always been a backdrop of violence going all the way back to the early, the earliest days in, in cases like, uh, director, uh, Desmond Taylor, I believe his name was, who, who was murdered in his home way back in like, I don't know, 1920 something, uh, and, and various others, uh, just, just from the very, very earliest days, Hollywood, Seem to uh, be be infested with these these very curious deaths. You know, I mean, if you look back over the years, all the way back, as you say, you know, there, there's just there's just case after case after case of uh, unsolved murders, or what, or and frequently what, what they're not they're not always listed as murders, but but uh, you know, if you really look at the, the details, they they're clear, they clearly are, and. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Hollywood to me is really just is has always been sort of a branch of the CIA, big sort of the entertainment branch of the CIA. I, I think it's it's just been I think it's just been filled with uh, with with uh, you know just laced with intelligence operations from day one, and that that mind control really kind of runs rampant in Hollywood uh, among the you know musicians and the acting community. Um, I, I think it's just everywhere, you know, it, it seems to be anyway. Um, and I, I think it's just, a, it's a very, very controlled, uh, community and, you know, and, and you, it, it really, it really couldn't be any other way when you think about it. The reach that Hollywood has, uh, to, to influence public opinion, not just here, but pretty much around the world. Uh, it's always just been this hugely influential force and, uh, you know, to, to think that it would be allowed to run independently of the intelligence community is really, to, to me, seems kind of, seems to be kind of naive, you know? Certainly, certainly. Um, you mention in your book, or in, a, you should write a book, you should put this all in a book. This is such, such fabulous writing and it's just wonderful. You ought to put it in the book. Uh, but you do mention uh, the, uh, let's see, let me find my notes here, about the uh, Lookout Mountain Laboratory, uh, which um, with such Hollywood luminaries like John Ford, Jimmy Stewart, Howard Hawks, Ronald Reagan, Bing Crosby, Walt Disney, Marilyn Monroe, had some sort of special clearance to work at this facility on undisclosed projects yeah that's uh that's well that's yeah that's another very curious fact about the whole laurel canyon scene is that right right literally smack dab in the middle of this of this uh remote canyon uh you know at the time populated primarily with uh you know bohemian beatnik musicians and whatnot there was a covert uh intelligence uh facility which was primarily served as a co covert film studio. <clears throat> it was actually considered to be the only self-contained film studio in existence. I mean, it was more advanced than anything that Hollywood, just right down the hill, had. Uh, and it's where they processed uh, uh, all of the uh, nuclear test uh, film footage and, and who knows what else they did there, put, you know, put together propaganda films and whatnot. And it was operating right there, you know, here you have this secret intelligence facility operating right there in the center of the canyon with all of these sons and daughters of the intelligence community swirling around it, you know, and we're supposed to believe that that's all just, you know, coincidental. Uh, but, you know, that, that's kind of hard to believe. And, yeah, and there were... There were uh, various Hollywood luminaries who had special clearance to actually work at this uh, facility. And to this day, uh, it's not known what exactly they did. 
but they occasionally uh, reported for duty to this covert film studio and, and did whatever it is that they did, you know, in conjunction with the, uh, you know, the people running the place. Uh, you know, so that that's a little odd <laughs> that that would be uh, situated right there. And uh, there was also a, a um, high-level male prostitution ring that was being run in Laurel Canyon at, at that very same time. Uh, and when that got, that, when that got raided and shut down, some of the, some of the, uh, quote unquote workers there claimed that their clientele included people, uh, as high up as like J. Edgar Hoover, you know? So <laughs> here you have J. Edgar Hoover, you know, cruising into the Laurel Canyon, you know, to do whatever he's doing, you know, and so there was this, and, you know, if, uh, if your readers are familiar with like the Craig Spence, you know, cowboy case in, in Washington DC or like the Larry King case in Nebraska, uh, you know, it was basically one of those types of operations, uh, that was going on that was, that was serving, you know, very high level clientele. And, and that was also going on, you know, right there, <laughs> right there in look. The so there, there was just so much, uh, so much intelligence activity swirling around what was supposed to be, uh, you know, this organic, uh, you know, bohemian scene that, uh, you know, as I said before, it just, it, it, the, the, the notion that it was all coincidental went out the window a long, long time ago for me because there's just, there's just way too many things going on there uh, that shouldn't have been going on if this was the, the scene that we were supposed to believe that it was. Sure. Uh, now, you talked about uh, James Dean and uh, Nick Adams, and you mentioned that they were both working, and I quote, were working the mean streets of Hollywood as young male prostitutes before their discovery. That's according to Nick Adams. Uh, some people have disputed that, but that's what Adams claimed, uh, I believe, after Je- after Dean had been killed in the... Uh, curious uh, accident that he was in and then of course uh nick adams himself turned up dead uh not not too long afterwards in his home in i believe coldwater canyon which is just just one canyon over from laurel and uh you know his death was under very very mysterious circumstances as were a couple others from the the, the, the you know co-starred with james dean uh, Natalie Wood, of course, her, her very curious drowning uh, uh, off Catalina Island while in the company of Robert Wagner and Christopher Walken. You know, there's still uh, numerous open questions about that one. And uh, yeah, there's just, there's just, it's just endless. Uh, you know, if you go to go to the website and, and read through the series, it's just, it's just an unfathomable number of uh, of names that. Of, of curious deaths that, that were attached to this this whole scene. Right, right, and and they were young. These people were, yeah, were very, so young. Uh, yeah, a lot of them were just very, very yeah, really, really young in their twenties, and uh, yeah, just some that yeah, some of the, the some that were considered just just uh, you know really very very talented and. Uh, you know, sort of on the forefront of the scene at the time that are now like just completely forgotten even that uh, they, they burned out so young. Um, yeah. I think Judy Still, I think, is the one name that it just, uh, I seem to, I can't even remember my own, <laughs> my own series. But, uh, yeah, a lot of them uh, just, just burned out very, very young. Very, you know, uh, Graham Parsons was one and, and just, just a, a whole bunch of them just right, right down the line. Right. And, uh, yeah, you, it, you it, mentioned that a lot of these music, musicians weren't really that talented. That it was sort of a facade that was was uh, built up, and that on the vinyl, on the record, they sounded great, but in person, it, it wasn't so great. That yeah, that's that's very true. Uh, um, you know, the Monkeys have gotten, and the Monkeys were another Laurel Canyon band, by the way, and uh, you know, very much a part of that scene, and and were were accepted as by the other, you know, more uh, credible, so to speak, bands uh, as peers. You know, they all they all hung out and jammed together and partied together and whatnot. 
and uh, which seems odd to people, you know, because the, the perception that most people have is that the Monkees were not a real band. They were just sort of this, this media creation, and they didn't write their own music, they didn't play their own music, and, you know, blah, blah, blah. But, but the reality is, is, is that that was not, that was not unique at all. Uh, a lot of these bands, most of them, in fact, did not play on their own album. Um, wow. There's Could a, you hold that thought, Dave? We do sure. have to take a three-minute break. We will be right back after a word from our sponsors. Welcome back, friends. My guest today is Dave McGowan. Uh, he has written this fabulous, fabulous multi-piece article. It is at davesweb.cnchost.com. And, um, you know, it's very interesting. Another guest this week, Dr. Michael Jones, uh, said that nudity was actually introduced for the first time in 1965 uh, in the pawnbroker. And I think that if you kind of piece all the all, the, all these pieces together, uh, like as as a puzzle, you think, wow, some really bad things were happening in the 60s. That totally altered the youth of this country. That totally altered our our culture and made it more acceptable to. Uh, it made us accept violence and nudity and all the things that that are really pretty bad for our for our culture. Dave. Oh yeah, hi. <laughs> I, I, I wasn't sure if you were done yet. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I don't. I don't. I, I don't. Wasn't aware of the uh, the nudity thing in the 60s, starting in the sixties. as possible. I. I, I, I yeah, you were a kid. You were five. Yeah, I was. I was only five years old. So I, was, <laughs> yeah. I wouldn't have seen it even. You probably didn't see that movie. Assume. But uh, anyway, just before the break, you were you were talking about how these people didn't really uh, play on their records, and, and that's one thing that I've I've gotten a lot of criticism about by by email from people uh, who are just outraged uh, that uh, you know that I've suggested that their their heroes weren't the musicians that they think they were. And I actually have a uh, article here that just appeared a few months ago in the uh, Wall Street Journal, uh, written by Mark Myers, who talked to uh, Hal Blaine. And Hal Blaine was the drummer for what was known as the Wrecking Crew. The Wrecking Crew was a uh, team of uh, crack studio musicians uh, that included people like Leon Russell before he became famous on keyboards, and Hal Blaine was the drummer. Um, Glenn Campbell, believe it or not, was actually one of the guitarists. And uh, but anyway, these these were a very very much in demand group of studio musicians, and they were the ones who really made almost all of the <laughs> of the records that came out of L.A. in the '60s and '70s. It's, it's it's astonishing, really. And I just wanted to read a few excerpts from here so that people will stop telling you know accusing me of like making this stuff up. Sure. And the article says. Uh, Outraged that the Monkees didn't play on all of their recordings. Well, it turns out that neither did the Beach Boys, the Mamas and the Papas, the Birds, the Association, Jan and Dean, and dozens of others. And then uh, this is a quote from Hal Blaine himself. He says, this is going to break your heart, but much of the music you heard in the 60s and early 70s wasn't recorded by the people you saw on the album covers. It was done by me and the musicians you see on these walls. Many of these kids didn't have the chops, and were little more than garage bands, uh, said Blaine. Then the reporter asked, is this why so many groups back then didn't sound as good in concert as they did on their records? And he says, you tell me, Mr. Blaine said, laughing. At concerts, people hear with their eyes. Teens cut groups slack in concert, but not when they bought their records. So this is coming directly from the guy who actually did play <laughs> on those records that uh, these people were not, in fact, uh, you know, professional quality musicians, and they, they could not, uh, they could not really perform their songs, you know, in a lot of cases. And uh, so all of those studio tracks were, were not recorded by the people that, as he said, by the people who, whose uh, pictures were on the album covers. Interesting. So. Uh, we we do have to take a one-minute top-of-the-hour break, and then we will be right back with our guest today, Dave McGowan. Stay tuned. Well, 
Welcome back, friends. This is the second hour of Spingola Speaks, and this is Deanna Spingola. My guest today is Dave McGowan, the author of Derailing Democracy, The America, The Media, Don't Want You to See, Understanding the F Word, and Programmed to Kill, The Politics of Serial Murder. Three books. Plus, he has also written this multi, um, multi-part, uh, what is it called? It's called Inside the LC, the strange but mostly true story of Laurel Canyon and the birth of the hippie generation. Now, that's just one thing that's very interesting on his website. He's also written about the moon landing, which I hope he will come back at some, some other day, on some other day and talk about that. Uh, his website is daveswebb.cnchost.com. Um, I did have an email over the break, uh, He and the uh, Tom asked, ask Dave to get into David Crosby and Stephen Stills. Uh, he says that he was at a CSNY concert in Tampa, Florida in 1974, and between songs, Stephen Sills, Stills blurted out that he spent a lot of time when he was young during the summer hanging out at his gung-ho, with his gung-ho, military uncles in their compound near Bartow, Florida. And he said that he remembered thinking at the time that that was a kind of a strange statement. Yeah, Stephen Stills' dad apparently was uh, some kind of shadowy intel operative. It's it's generally difficult to discern that from uh, the mainstream biographies, but uh, little bits and pieces I picked up would seem to indicate that. And he seemed to be particularly active in, like, uh, uh, Central American affairs and uh, still actually uh, lived part of his childhood down there in various places in and around military bases, I believe, uh, you know, covert uh, operations-type bases and stuff. And uh, he actually was known to tell people that he had uh, covertly served over in Vietnam in the very early years of Vietnam before we had uh, had ground troops there. And um, that's been uh, almost universally dismissed by his uh, various biographers and whatnot as being uh, an impossibility because, you know, he was on the, on the music scene by the time we had troops on the ground uh, in Vietnam, so it's been regarded as, as not, not being possible, but... Uh, it, it, it is, in fact, quite possible that he could have been because, you know, if he had been there, it would have been in a covert capacity. And, and we certainly did have, quote, unquote, advisors uh, all over the country before we, you know, officially had troops on the ground. So it, it remains kind of an open question. Did, you know, was he a, a covert operative over there, before, you know, or just a year or two before he emerged as, a, you know, as one of the Laurel Canyon musicians, it's, it's quite possible given it, given his family background. Uh, David Crosby's father, Floyd Delafield Crosby, uh, also did some, some intelligence work and, uh, and Crosby actually comes from one of the, the elite bloodline, American bloodlines. Uh, his full name is David Van Cortland Crosby and he is a direct descendant of the, of this Three sort of interlinked uh, families with the Van Rensselaer, Van Cortland, and Van uh, Schuler or Schuyler, not sure how it's pronounced, uh, families that, that are, they were all sort of intermarried and, and go back like to the founding of the country. And, uh, you know, if you, if you go on like Wikipedia and, uh, you know, hit the, hit up those names, you know, Van Cortland, Van Rensselaer, or Van Schuyler, uh, you'll see that he comes from a long and very prestigious line of, you know, senators, congressmen, uh, Civil War and Revolutionary War generals, you know, signers of the Declaration of Independence, and, and just, you know, all of these, these uh, you know, his family has been, you know, sort of at the top of the food chain for a couple long hundred time. years. Long time, yeah. Uh, we do have to take a three-minute break. We will be right back after a word from our sponsors. My guest today is Dave McGowan. His website is davesweb.cnchost.com. 
And uh, just scroll down, and you will see his uh, his article inside the LC, the strange but mostly true story of Laurel Canyon and the birth of the hippie generation. Also, we have about 15 minutes until the pledge drive ends, so if you have not donated, you still have time. Um, tell us about Sal Minio. Uh, you, were uh, talking, oh. you were talking about um, the Crosby family. First, let's, let's get back to the Crosby family. You were talking about uh, the roots all the way back to the founders. And I think that is so interesting because if you look at some of the people and, and some of their uh, family connections, you think, my gosh, it, it would appear that the same elite group of people have been controlling things for generations and generations, and now they're just controlling it, uh, controlling the, the culture in a, in a totally different way through, uh, you know, the uh, counterculture with the music in the 60s and, and the films and, and, uh, and basically television itself is really a vehicle for mind control. Uh, because they are presenting what they would have us believe is culture, when in fact the stuff that people see on TV may not have any any connection or relationship at all to their own family or their own life. Yeah, it's absolutely. Yeah, uh, TV really is, is is a very insidious uh, invention. You know, it it it, uh, it really and, and and it was really the, the sort of the beginning of sort of isolating us. Uh, you know, in this country, uh, you know, before that, entertainment w- was a much more of a sort of a public thing. You know, you'd gather in the public square, or, you know, whatever it was. And, and uh, TV, when TV was introduced, that's that's when you know uh, it really sort of it really began to break the social bonds and the community ties, and people began, you know, just huddling in their own homes with their families, you know, watching, uh, you know, Ed Sullivan or whatever it was back then. And, uh, you know, it really began to, to, to sort of isolate us, uh, into smaller and smaller units, so to speak. And, the, you know, computers and the internet has, has really even accelerated that. So we're, you know, we're, we're really being sort of isolated into, into, you know, islands of one, you know. Right, and, right. And that, that, that's not accidental, you know, that, that's very deliberate, you know, as the, as time goes on and, and technology proliferates, it gets harder and harder for people to, uh, you know, to organize, to, uh, you know, to, to, you know, seek some real significant change in this country. And, and it's going to get harder and harder as we become more and more socially isolated. You know, I mean, it's very ironic that, you know, we're supposed to be even more and more connected than ever now through, you know, social networking and Twitter and Facebook and all that. But, but it really, it really serves to, to isolate us, you know, and I, I see it in my kids, and, and it really bothers me, you know, that, that uh, you know, when, when I was a kid, uh, you know, when school was out, all the kids were, were running amok, you know, and, and if you went out, like, after school, drove by, a, drove by a school, you'd see kids out playing in the playground and, and you know, doing their thing and out in the streets playing, and, and you know, we, and my kids... <laughs> My kids come from come home from school. They go straight to their room and log on to their computer, you know, and pick up their cell phone. And they got you know one conversation going on the computer and another one going by text message, you know, on their phone or their iPods or whatever. And you know, I just put all that stuff down and go outside and actually, you know, actually interact face to face with your friends. You know, it's it's. Hi. it's so yeah, I mean it's it's really uh, it's really been a very a very insidious process of of sort of isolating us more and more socially and making us more and more powerless, you know. Right, right. And and you really have to understand that beginning in in the late 1920s in 1927 when they had the Radio Act that our media is controlled by the government. Oh, very much. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's it's totally controlled. Uh, yeah, I, I mean it's, it's yeah, and, and they all, you know, and it may appear that there's like to some people that there's like a huge difference between like Fox News and MSNBC or whatever, but you know, I mean, they're they're using slightly different, you know, just sort of sort of slightly.
slightly different techniques, but they're all basically pushing the country in the in the direction that uh, you know those at the top of the food chain want it to go, and, and it's been like that for a very long time. Certainly, uh, you talked in your article. We'll get back to Salminio, but as long as we're talking about Fox News, uh, you talked in your article. I don't remember which part it was, but about Joe Pine and. Um, how he kind of paved the way for the likes of Bill O'Reilly, Rush Limbaugh, Sean Hannity, Michael Savage, Don Imus, Martin Downey, Jerry Springer, all those people. I, I don't know who Joe Pine is, but other than I didn't Martin. either. I, I only know about him through what I've read, but yeah, apparently he was a very one of the uh, a very early sort of muckraker that would uh, have very controversial guests on and get get in shouting matches with them and. Uh, uh, which is, you know, very controversial for the time. And, uh, yeah, he, he kind of set the stage for this whole sort of very confrontational, very bombastic uh, style that, that we see, like, everywhere nowadays. Um, but, uh, yeah, he, he was kind of the guy that pioneered that, first on the radio and on the TV and then on the, and then on the TV show. And I think it was, it was more of a local uh, phenomenon than a nationwide one. And... Uh, you know, I I I, I was I, I I don't remember the guy at all just just from what I've read, but uh, yeah, apparently he was he was kind of a kind of a trendsetter. He was like he and he was a, I think a Marine veteran and a, a very uh, rough and tumble kind of guy that would that would just you know just basically just tell tell his guests exactly what he thought of them. And uh, right. he ended up dying very young too, I believe, didn't he? He, uh, uh, he died at the age of 45, March 23rd, 1970, according to your article. Yeah, well, that was fairly young, and to me, it's young. It's, it's right. Than I am now, <laughs> so it didn't seem young once upon a time, but it seems young now. Right. Okay, let's talk about Sal Minio. He was a. He was what? He was a singer. He was a, an actor. He was another contemporary of uh, James Dean. Actually, he was part part of that. Uh, you know, James Dean, Dennis Hopper, uh, uh, Nick Adams clique. Uh, they all appeared together in, in one of those big uh, big name. What was it? John, uh, James Dean only did like two or three films. You know, that, that uh, established this, this uh, long lasting legacy. And, and right, one like of Rebel them, Without a Cause. Yeah, Rebel Without was that the one? It was either Rebel Without a Cause or Giant, the uh, East of Eden. One of one of uh, East of Eden. East of Eden. I, I I know that I've seen them, uh, but uh, yeah, just just the things that they played in kind of promoted that same same kind of mentality. Yeah, and then Sal Minio was was another uh, another member of the, of that group, and and another one that died very very young, and who died right at the mouth of Laurel Canyon, who was uh, murdered. Uh, in the uh, in the par- like in the driveway parking uh, structure of his apartment building, right at the right at the mouth of Laurel Canyon, uh, yeah, along along with all <laughs> along with all the other uh, trail of bodies, yeah, he he was yet another 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 young Hollywood personality who uh, met a very tragic and violent end, um, right right in the midst of this this whole scene that was going on at the time. I, I find that. That's kind of fascinating that all these people died so young. Uh, I mean, if they were serving an intelligence operation purpose, were they were they murdered? Who who would have murdered them? I mean, what what would be behind something like that? That's a question I get a lot. You know, is, is people are like, well, is, is uh, does that mean that they were like the good guys? You know, and that they had so they had to be silenced. They had to get be get gotten rid of and. And I, I don't know if that's necessarily the case. I think uh, I think they're, they're all sort of considered expendable for a cause, you know. And um, and I, I, I just believe that that at some point some of them, you know, had outlived their usefulness. They were maybe considered of more value dead than alive, or uh, you know, perhaps they've become a problem. Maybe their programming was breaking down or something. I don't know. And and. You know, that it had been determined that they had become uh, more of a liability than an asset. Um, I, I can't really answer that question definitively. You know, there, there's, there's probably different reasons for different people. But, you know, I mean, a lot of them 
a lot of them died very young, you know, or or maybe didn't, you know. Then there, there, there's some of them, you know, like Jim Morrison, that that still to this day people question whether whether he really did die at 27. Uh, you know, he was yet, uh, as we already noted, a, another key member of the Laurel Canyon scene that, that uh, and one who died young, but uh, about whom there's there's still questions to this day whether he really did die or, or uh, just sort of faked it and. And you know, having served his purpose in that milieu, had had uh, you know faked his death and, and reemerged as, as someone else because he was he was quite a chameleon. Uh, he, he he definitely had the ability to 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 uh, you know take on uh, various personas, and and it's quite possible in my mind that that he uh, you know that it, that he did in fact fake his death. I don't know what have you have you uh, read much about that or. Uh, no, I haven't, but I was uh, thinking of other people who might affect their deaths, and I'm trying to think of the uh, uh, the, uh, the so-called conservative reporter that was married to, um, I can't think. Uh, she was on one of the planes, and she supposedly called her husband, who was the um, attorney general. Uh, and uh, Olsen, the Olsen. Olsen, yeah, yes, the, yes, yes, I was thinking. Like, Gosh, yeah, I wonder if she did. did. I, that's what I was kind of thinking when you were saying that. Yeah, uh, we, was... we do have to take a three-minute break, but think about that, and we'll be back in three minutes. All righty, we are back, and my guest today is Dave McGowan, and uh, we were talking about uh, the Olsen woman, and uh, I mean, I think it's just very interesting that her husband is married to someone that kind of looks almost like his former wife. Hello? Yes. Oh, okay. I, 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 you dropped out for a minute there. I didn't. I didn't oh, catch. okay. Yeah, his uh, his current wife uh, looks very similar to uh, what uh, Olson looked like. Oh, who's, does who's she? Supposed... I was not yeah. aware. I didn't even know that he'd been remarried. Uh, yeah, no, I was not aware of that. But yeah, that that was a a rather curious uh, incident. Yeah, that she just happened to be on supposedly on one of those planes and happened to be the one that made a couple of cell phone calls. And, or said uh, she did. I mean, it's not even possible above yeah. 5,000 feet. I mean, I, you know, maybe, I don't know. Um, I got an email during the break, and it said, um, uh, Laurel, <clears throat> Laurel Canyon Series, what a fantastic breed. I turned 13, uh, and this is from uh, Stephen. I turned 13 on the day the Beatles appeared on The Sullivan Show for the first time. Within a year, I was growing my hair long and singing in a band in junior high. The British Invasion was very effective. Uh, what an intriguing read. Thanks, Dave. Uh, you referenced Lori Jacobson in your work. I grew up with her. She was one of my fans. Do you know her personally? And this is from Steve. No, no, I don't. I don't know any of these people personally. No, <laughs> and they, they probably have if they are familiar with my series, they probably wouldn't want to be associated with me personally. <laughs> uh, but no, no, uh, I, I, no I, I don't know any of these people. I've never spoken to any of them. Uh, no. Uh-uh. You know, it's interesting that Steve uh, grew his hair long and started playing in a band, and now we have such characters like Lady Gaga and, and Britney Spears, and uh, young women are emulating them, which I think is just horribly disgusting. Um we do have some callers on the line. Let's take a couple of calls. Let's take Larry from Louisiana. Larry, welcome to the program. Hi. Uh, what did you uh, have got on Robert Zimmerman uh, as far as his ties to the CIA or his family or the military-industrial complex or Skull and Bones or like that? Uh, Dylan? Yeah. Uh, I have not actually looked into him. He was not uh he was not part of the Laurel Canyon scene. He was actually the sort of the, the head of the uh Greenwich Village uh scene, which I which I have, have thought about possibly looking into in the future, but as of now I have not uh have not looked into either that or the or the uh, backgrounds of the various San Francisco bands, I have I've also considered, uh, you know, branching out into that, but have have not gotten into that at this point. So I, I couldn't really, uh, I I know very little about about him at this point. Okay, well, listen to Desolation Row, and then look at the Jonestown incident, and you'll see it way ahead of time. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Larry. Okay, let's take Steve in Arizona. Steve, welcome to the program. Hi, thanks for taking my call. 
Um, this is an interesting subject, and I, I hope you guys do more future shows, like more like this, like culture and music, because uh, I'm tired about hearing about the Fed all the time. Um, but at any rate, um, I, I wanted to ask the uh, the guest, what is connection? Are you uh, connected to Laurel Canyon anyway? Did you grow up in that area, and are you were you connected to the music industry? Uh, no, I was not connected to the music industry. I did grow up in the area. I, I was born and raised. Uh, I was actually born in uh, born and raised in Torrance, a uh, suburb of L.A., and I've lived my entire life, uh, 51 years now, in various parts of the uh, the L.A. area. And uh, I used to drive actually through Laurel Canyon daily because it's the it was the, it's the most convenient way to get from the part of the valley I was living at to the uh, west side. So I actually years years and years before I ever started this series, I uh, I regularly traveled through Laurel Canyon, but never never gave it any thought. Uh, it was just a you know a way to get across town, basically, uh, no different than, than, than any other, any other route. And, uh, it only, it was only when I started doing all this research just a few years ago that it sort of took on a whole new significance for me. And, uh, and I began hanging out there quite a bit, uh, just wandering around, taking pictures, just, just getting a feel for the place. So I, uh, you know, I, that's my only real connection to it is that I grew up around it and, uh, for a while, you know, to, uh, hung out there for a bit just just to just to get a just to get a feel for the place. Okay, because um, I want to I want to go back there back to Laurel Canyon one day, and I was wondering if you could tell me if there's any special spots that I could check out on Laurel Canyon. Uh, well, probably the most the most well known spots are the uh, the corner where the uh, alleged Houdini Mansion sets, which is now in ruins. And right across the street from that, which is where the former log cabin sat, which was uh, a very, a very, very well-known gathering spot during this. this uh, it was run for a while by uh, Frank Zappa. He lived there and basically ran it as sort of an open house for the Laurel Canyon musicians. But uh, unfortunately, that is now gone and fenced in, and uh, the Houdini Mansion burned down. Uh, God, way back in like '59 or something like that. Uh, but you can still see sort of the, the ruins of those two two places right on on the corner of Laurel Canyon Boulevard and uh, Lookout Mountain Road, I think. And then farther down uh, is the Laurel Canyon Country Store, which is is sort of a landmark. It was a very very popular hangout uh, at the time for for the various musicians. Uh, uh-huh. There are various other places that are very interesting, like the, the Wonderland Murder House, which is, is still there, still standing, hasn't hasn't changed a bit. It looks exactly like uh, like it did at the time, but but those are harder to find if you don't if you don't know your way around. Okay, we we do have to take a break. We will be right back in three minutes. Welcome back, friends. My guest today is Dave McGowan, and his website Dave'sWeb.cnchost.com. And um, you were uh, an- talking with uh, Steve from Arizona. Uh, Steve, did you have another question? Or yeah, I'm um, I'm interested in three people in particular. I'm interested in Frank Zappa, Neil Young, and Jackson Brown. If you could just kind of uh, briefly go into those three guys, was uh, what was Frank Zappa all about? Was he like the head of the Laurel Canyon scene, or what was his deal? He was one of the yeah he was one of one of the main uh, figures there. He he basically as I said he he ran this log cabin which had uh, originally been owned by Tom Mix. It was uh, it was this big huge rambling uh, structure that he and his uh, wife and and kids lived in, and they basically ran it as sort of an open house. Uh, that, all of the other Laurel Canyon musicians would regularly stop by and and just have jam sessions and party and whatnot, and it was just just sort of a continuous flow of people. There, there were several houses like that in Laurel Canyon. John Phillips' house was another one. Cass Elliott's was another one uh, that were just regular regular gathering spots. Um, so they they were they were some of the the, the, the key figures definitely uh, in the canyon. Um, and uh yeah zappa he he had a, a very interesting history you know his dad as i said was a 
was a, uh, I believe it was a chemical warfare engineer at the Edgewood Arsenal and actually lived in the facility. Frank Zappa actually spent the first first several years of his childhood actually living at, on the grounds of the, the Edgewood Arsenal, you know, of all places. So, uh, yeah, he, he had a very, very unusual upbringing. Uh, Jackson Brown, oh, uh, I'm drawing a blank on Jackson Brown, actually. I know I covered him in there, but I, yeah. um. Yeah, yeah it's in the first, uh, two or second or third part. But, uh, yeah, interesting. Okay. Yeah. We we do have some other callers. Okay. So thanks thanks very much, Steve, for calling in. Uh, Barry, let's take Barry in California. How are you guys doing? Good. How are you? Good. Um, you mentioned about mind control. Um, it's been mentioned that uh, Britney Spears and Christine Aguilera, uh, which they were Musketeers in the Musketeer Club. Oh yeah. That um, you know, you know, uh, Freeman, he covers a lot of the uh, uh, symbolism of uh, the New World Order. Him and Tex Mars have partnered up together, and he mentions uh, them that they're part of the uh, Ultra uh, Mind Control. Mm-hmm. MK Ultra. Mm-hmm. Does your and then I have another question, but uh, who is actually controlling this? thing from the 60s on is it uh, part of the uh, the Zionists or uh, you know because they do control uh, uh, Hollywood Dave what do you think uh, um, the, well as far as like the the, the Britney I, I would I would tend to agree that, that definitely uh, you know, uh, Britney, people like Britney Spears and, and Christina Aguilera are, are most likely or almost certainly uh, mind control victims. But um, I think that's really just the, the tip of the iceberg. I, I think it runs rampant in in, in Hollywood. I, I think the, a very large proportion of uh, of Hollywood is uh, is controlled. You know, and, and it's long been said that uh, you know Hollywood is 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 controlled by the agents. You know, meaning the the talent agents, and I, I think that <laughs> I think that statement is true on, on a number of levels. Uh, so yeah, I, I would tend to agree with that. As far as is is who who's been running the show for for all these years, you know, I, I, that's a good question. Um, virtually every every conceivable uh, quote unquote secret society, and you know, every big name that's ever come up in the conspiracy literature has surfaced in my research in connection with one or more of these people. You know, I mean, whether it's the Masons or the Rothschilds or Skull and Bones or uh, the OTO or, you know, any, any of these other names or, or organizations or, uh, you know, figures that, 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 that regularly come out in the conspiracy literature can be found woven through this story. Uh, who, who, who ultimately pulls the strings? I, I, I couldn't really answer that. I, you know, that, that's, uh, I don't know. <laughs> I wish I did know, you know, I mean, uh, my, my view of, of how the world works is, is still a, a sort of evolving, you know, I mean, uh, Ten years ago, I, I thought that I understood how the world works, and uh, and I was actually very naive at the time. And I, I ventured down a lot of very dark rabbit holes since then, and realized that that uh, you know things are actually much worse than even I had thought. And and it's 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 a it's a learning process for me as well. And I hope to one day have all the answers, but but I, I as of now, I, I I couldn't really tell you. And just one more quick question. Lady Gaga, I just got an email uh, that in her shows, uh, she brings in a lot of the New World Order, and then on her makeup, she has the, the eye of Cyrus. Cyrus. Um, yeah, her, her videos are just filled with occult uh, and, and New World Order type symbolism, and uh, yeah, she's, uh, she's, she's, a, she's an interesting one. I mean, the... the the stars of today, you know, I mean, I, I mentioned earlier that, that, that talent uh, wasn't necessarily the main reason that these, these 60s uh, idols, be, 
you know, became the, the big stars that they are. And, and I think that's generally true in Hollywood. And more and more we seem to see these just really manufactured, prepackaged entertainers just sort of arise out of nowhere. I mean, how old is this lady? Got? She's like 24 years old or something. I don't know. And, I mean, a few years ago she was, like, virtually unknown, and now she's, like, the biggest thing in the world. You know, and uh, to me, that's not that's not really based on talent. From what I've seen and heard, you know, these these people just seem to to emerge as these fully formed, you know, prepackaged media sensations, and uh, you know, and it's all it's all laced with symbolism, and, and you know, there's, there's a lot of overtones of mind control, and and I believe it's just it's all aimed at sort of keeping the, hurting the people onto the path that they want us to take, you know? Yeah, I, I believe that we have to be careful uh, what our kids are uh, listening to and watching because it, it does go into the subliminal uh, mind and yeah, back well, and forth to the consciousness. Yeah, you know, the, the, the has mentioned a couple of times about how, you know, television and Hollywood in general has, has really sort of desensitized us to, to ever-increasing levels of violence and... and uh, and various other things, and and one of the things that uh, that I find most disturbing is is the sexualization of children. That uh, you yeah. know, and uh, you know, as she mentioned, you know, the people like like, like Lady Gaga are, are sort of pushed as, as role models, you know, for preteen girls, and uh, and more and more and more, yeah, it just seems to be uh, there seems to be a major effort in that regard, you know, and. And that actually, in a way, that ties back to Laurel Canyon because uh, I don't know if, if people remember this, but John Phillips, who was definitely one of the key figures in the Laurel Canyon scene and, and uh, really was, was one of the main guys that, that helped to mainstream that, that scene by putting together the Monterey Pop Festival and, and sort of bringing that whole scene to the rest of the country. <clears throat> but anyway, his, uh, his daughter Bijou, uh, when she was just 14, was in an ad campaign put on by Calvin Klein that was just so wildly inappropriate that it was actually investigated by the U.S. Justice Department as being potentially child pornography. Uh, you know, so here you have the, the the daughter of one of these key Laurel Canyon figures that, that was that was helping to push that agenda along in a big way. So, you know, as I said before, everything... <laughs> Everything just kind of goes in circles and ties back into, you know. So, anyway. Thank you for your answers. You guys have You're a nice welcome. day. Thanks. Thanks, Barry. Okay, we have a couple email questions. Um, okay, um, going to Doris Day's association with some of these shady characters. Uh, Doris Day was the mother of Terry Melcher who uh, actually lived in the Cielo Drive house with his then-girlfriend, Candace Bergen, um, the house where the Manson murders were connect were uh, committed. And uh, Gary Melcher actually had direct connections to Charles Manson, and it, uh, he, was, uh, he was one of the, uh, the uh, key uh, like, uh, uh, industry people behind the, the the Laurel Canyon music scene. He was a producer and, uh, you know, for, for uh, various of these bands. And he actually had co- very very close association with uh, with Manson and uh, and at one point was, was going to, uh, was supposedly going to sign and, and record him and, you know, help make, the, make him into uh, yet another, you know, but, you know, <laughs> Charlie Manson's uh, could have had a much different life arc, you know, <laughs> rather than right. being now known as one of uh, one of America's most notorious killers. He could have been up there with, you know, Neil Young and, and uh, <laughs> David Crosby and, and Jim Morrison is one of the, the, the figures of the, the 60s music scene, you know, strangely enough. So yeah, that, that was... Uh, that was how Terry Melcher was, was tied into that whole thing, and, and he, he he being the son of uh, of Doris Day. Wow. Okay, another question. Uh, she said, or he says, I know this is not about Laurel Canyon, but what about Yoko Ono? And he says, I believe she was some sort of government asset, and John Lennon at age 40 was taken out for some reason. Their bed in and the rest of their lifestyle was too bizarre. 
your comments? Uh, I have not written anything about that because it's not really connected to the scene, but I tend to think that uh, that Yoko probably set him up, actually, uh, from what I've read and, and heard over the years. Uh, yeah, I, I believe that she was she was very likely in on the plot or her behavior at the time, and, and uh, yeah, I, I, I think she probably was, uh, you know, very much, uh, very much a... a involved in that um but you know but that's that's not uh you know as uh as you as, as the caller uh indicated it's not, yeah it's not directly related to laurel canyon and i haven't really looked into it that deeply or written about it but that's just my own personal take on it is that uh yeah she probably was sure uh <laughs> another question um could you ask Dave if the Manson gang had X's or swastikas on their heads at the time of the court hearings? Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, it started out as an X. Yeah, he he uh, he carved an X in his forehead, and then uh, uh, a number of the girls did as well. And then he converted it into a swastika, and they did. Yeah, and uh, there's actually old 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 old, uh, old pictures you can find of the girls. Uh, groups of them hanging out in front of these, you know, these little bands of hippie Manson girls hanging out in front of the courthouse out on the street with their, uh, with their little head carvings. Yeah. Interesting. <laughs> was, uh, oh my yeah, goodness. Was, was quite, what the people to, to engage in such a lifestyle? Is it, is it for fame and fortune or? I just don't understand that kind of mentality. Why people would even want to, to be a part of that. As far as his followers, you mean? Uh, as far as all of these people, um, why would any of these people even want to be a part of that? Is it for fame and fortune? Uh, why would people choose such a lifestyle or, uh, for all these music- musicians? I, I I don't necessarily believe that they chose it. I, I tend to okay. think that it was most likely chosen for them and that they were basically, you know, groomed from a very early age to uh, – you know, to fill these positions. Just like I, I think a lot of politicians. You know, I, I think Obama was groomed for his position, you know. For, for, oh, for I agree there, early, yes. You know, I, I think, uh, you know, I think these people are just, you know, they're part of uh, bloodline families or whatever it is, and they're just, they're chosen from a very early age and, and sort of groomed and programmed to fill a particular role in society. Uh, you know, whether, you know, you uh, know, a position that that, that has a, a large impact on on public opinion, you know. Okay. Yeah, I think you said that. It's just so hard to believe, and and, and of course, uh, in as much as that would not be a particularly good lifestyle, it makes sense that they were brainwashed and and groomed and programmed to to participate in it. It was, it's not a it's not a very uh, it doesn't make for a very lengthy life in most no. cases or a very healthy life you know I mean a lot of these people were just were pretty severe drug addicts you know uh, to a to a pretty extreme degree you know uh, it was just there was just a massive amount of drugs that were being pumped into the canyon at the time as well and uh, you know they uh, yeah it was it was it was Decidedly not a healthy lifestyle, and, and for a lot of them, it, uh, they, they, did not, they didn't make it very far. Um, uh, now, you mentioned in connection with um, the Lookout Mountain Laboratory, you mentioned Ronald Reagan. Do you suppose yeah. that he was groomed also to be the president? Oh, I would imagine so. Yeah, I, you know, I, I think most of the presidents in my lifetime, and probably well beyond that, were were most likely groomed for the for the presidency. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, what about Walt Disney? I've heard some very unsavory things about him. I've heard a lot of unsavory things. I mean, there's there's so much, you know, rumors of uh, Nazi affiliations, rumors of pedophilia, just. Uh, all sorts of unsavory, uh, you know, uh, stories that are circulated about him. Uh, how much of it is true? I I would tend to think that probably at least a, a good portion of it probably is. But uh, could I definitively state that at this point? No, not really. You know, it's, it's, again, it's not. 
not something that I've that I've spent a huge amount of time. You know, I mean, I know that he was he was intimately involved with uh, some of the Nazi scientists that were brought over on, in the paperclip project, uh, uh-huh. particularly Werner von Braun. You know, the, the, the one of the key figures in the uh, Apollo project. Uh, he definitely, and he he's the one that really helped sell uh, Von Braun to the American people, you know, uh, despite his, his rather sordid past. Uh, but, you know, I, uh, beyond that, I, I, yeah, there's no, I, don't, I, don't, I couldn't really say, but uh, I would tend to think that probably he wasn't, uh, he wasn't the nice old Uncle Walt or whatever that we're, that we're supposed to believe that he was. Sure, would, sure. Would be my, my um, gut instinct. Uh, We do have to take our last three-minute break. We will be right back after a word from our sponsors. Stay tuned. I'm back, friends. My guest today has been Dave McGowan. His website is davesweb.cnchost.com. And uh, another listener wants to know if you've ever heard of the book called Thanks for the Memories. Apparently, some of the things that you've been uh, telling us about uh, are in that book. Uh, yeah, I am familiar. It was written by uh, Bryce Taylor, I believe, is the pseudonym she used. I think her real name is like Susan Ford. And, mm. uh, yeah, it's a self-published uh, book. came out, I don't know when, but quite a ways back. I read it years and years and years ago, and it's, uh, it's basically her sort of, the story of her personal journey through uh uh, you know, as a as a as a lifelong mind control victim of, uh, and she names people like uh, you know high level politicians like Henry Kissinger, as well as very high level Hollywood personalities like uh, Bob Hope, as being uh, uh, her torturers and, and programmers. And uh, Disneyland, I believe, played a key a key role in that. I think a lot of the from what I remember, I think she's uh, indicated that a lot of the programming had been sort of keyed into to, to Disneyland themes, or it had even occurred at Disneyland, I believe. Um, so yeah, yeah, I'm familiar with it. I, I believe that I don't necessarily believe everything that's in there. I think I think she's very sincere, and that she that she very much believes it. But I think there's some aspects of it that that. Uh, you know, maybe a little off the mark, but uh, the, the basic, uh, you know, the basic, the basic concepts that she's that she's talking about are, are undoubtedly, uh, you know, unfortunately, a reality. Right. I think there's so many things that we really, when we learn something, we think, oh gosh, I can't believe that, and after we hear it, to, you know, a second or a third time, we think, okay, yeah, that's probably true, but. Um, this is amazing. Um, another question: What about Squeaky Frome's attempted assassination of Ford? Yeah, that was another that was another weird one, wasn't it? Yeah, you got one of the the Manson girls. Uh, uh, yeah, you know, later uh, attempting to become a presidential assassin. Uh, you know, and, and which isn't really all that surprising when when you realize that the 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 Manson family was, in all likelihood, a you know a, a CIA-run mind control program. So uh, that one of them would would later emerge as a potential presidential assassin probably probably shouldn't shouldn't really shock us. Uh, Squeaky Fromm, by the way, went to high school with with Phil Hartman uh, Saturday Night Live. <laughs> really? Night oh, yeah. Who was also a key Laurel Canyon figure before he became uh, well known as a comedian? He was actually a graphic artist, and he like designed uh, album covers for some of these Laurel Canyon bands, and, and even designed the, the the CSN logo, the logo that the, the band CSN uses to this day, was designed by Phil Hartman. And wow. he was yet, yet another victim of, of violent crime at a very young age, supposedly killed by his wife, I think it was. In right. Yes. Yeah. Story that made no sense whatsoever. So, yeah, so here you have another, you know, another tie into all of it. So, you know, like I said, everything, everything just goes around and around in circles, you know, and you just, you just keep, you just keep trying to follow the, follow it wherever it goes, you know. Sure. We have run out of time, Dave. Will you come back? Oh, sure. Love to. Oh, we'd love to have you back. So, thank you so much for being on the program today. Thank you for having me. All righty, bye-bye. Bye.
Bye, listeners. Talk to you tomorrow.